scale the same boom. Uh, and I think there is a lot of local authorities in uh, Middle England, to use that famous phrase, who also are suffering, who also don't understand what we're doing to, and we need to create that coalition of local governments being treated unfairly, irrespective of whether you happen to be conservative in Birmingham, for instance, or, or, or independent members. I'm going to also say, quite honestly, um, the smaller parties are all lumped in together with the independent group, and, and, and the Greens are as well, and several other small parties are. And the independent group, I found absolutely frustrating. Uh, the, the willingness to have any debate about the current administration of Iran is almost, you can't say it, or we can't walk the vote. We've got to be subservient. I mean, let's be honest, but that's the attitude of large members of the LGA. So I think, I think if, if uh, uh, Tom Drummond's amendment about being diplomatic, I have to say, I think the time of being diplomatic is well, well gone. We can't afford for our residents to be diplomatic anymore. We can't afford to be diplomatic. We can't fudge the issue anymore. Local government, and it's not just Liverpool, is a treaty of appallingly. And Councilman Moore made the point, if our national public services have been treated in the same proportionate reductions. There would be heartbreak for this, but it's easy to pass on the local government because they're not putting their hands up to vote for cutbacks. And I think we do need to take the diplomacy off and start taking robustly, because if we don't, nothing will change. And that's why we will support uh, the main motion um, without the First Amendment. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. I will speak now and then I will formally move the amendment as it's going to be accepted. I actually substantially agree with the critique and indeed the criticism uh, of the LGA made by Mayor Anderson today. I'm actually the only person now who's been an office holder of some sort uh, of the LGA since the day it opened for business on the 1st of April 1997 when it was formed by the merger of the three existing local government bodies. At that time, the LGA was far more robust. Its first chair for the first seven years was Jeremy Beecham, the former Labour leader of Newcastle Council, and he was quite prepared to stand up to the Labour government if it needed to be stood up to. Uh, indeed, um, we did a lot of things together, including, for example, stopping the Labour government pursuing the idea of police, elected police commissioners, uh, although that was later, of course, uh, brought back in by uh, the, the Tories. Uh, but what's clearly happening now is that the LGA has become too subservient to the government. Now, no party has ever controlled the LGA, it's always been balanced, there have always been four groups there, but usually it has been far more robust than it has been over the last two or three years. Of course, just as the mayor, as this council has to be the Tory government, you cannot always go in a gun boat, you cannot always take a cannon with you, you have to be robust, but also accept the fact that they're the government. But what's happened is that too many press releases, too many statements have been watered down to give a position which isn't reflective of the four groups, but is really reflective of just one group. A group that is now the biggest party in the LGA by just 0.2%. So it's not as though they're nearly in overall control, they'd have more rights if that was the case. They're there, the LGA is able to represent all of us. So I have increasingly felt that at ease, and I was very pleased, therefore, that the mayor uh, put down this motion, and I'm even more pleased that he's accepted the amendment we're moving as a positive way forward to try and do something to correct what I believe is now a serious imbalance within the Algeria. Um, is there anybody further want to speak on this amendment? Because if not, I think I'm going to take the vote, okay? Yeah. Okay, can we take the voting for this amendment, please? Um, the amendment only, yeah, just, just Councillor Crown's amendment. Okay, those in favour of the amendment? Sorry? Those in favour of the amendment? Those against the amendment?
abstentions? Okay, the result is 4, 4, and again it's 77 with no abstention. So the result of the amendment is that it has been lost. We've now got Councillor Kemp's. It's an addendum, it's not an amendment, no, it's an addendum. So do you want to speak to it? No, it's just formula. Oh, formula, okay. So we've now got speakers for the main motion. Who wants to speak? No? Okay, are we moving to the vote? Excellent, I would think. Okay. Those in favour of the motion? <coughs> Substantive. Is it agreed unanimously? Yeah? Item 10, Summer Events by Mayor Joe Anderson over here and Councillor Andy Simon. Can I invite Mayor Anderson to move the motion standing in his name, please? Thank you, Mayor Anderson. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, just very briefly, I think the uh, motion largely speaks for itself, but I think it's really important to recognise uh, the work that is done right across the city in our communities and also the, the major events that take place in the city, be they sporting or cultural events. And quite often when they occur, you know, people do come to the council and do thank uh, the individual organisers of the event. And quite often it is those main organisers that do get thanked. And I think it's really important uh, when we've had such a fantastic uh, year of events and we've got many more events to come in our communities and in our city uh, in 17, leading up to, to 2018 that we don't forget all of those people that make these events possible uh, and staff that very rarely in partners very rarely get mentioned like staff in licensing, people who actually prepare a lot of the documents in and around the, the back staff if you like in the offices who, who prepare all the, uh, the, the police uh, applications etc and also you know our partners in Glendale uh, neighbourhood services who, particularly with the community events, give a lot of support to local councillors in, in organising those events. Our street cleansing teams, our enforcement officers, you know, the many stewards, and, and most of all, those volunteers. We've got a city of fantastic volunteers, be those volunteering in their own community, and of all, all of those who come together for our major events, uh, town after town, who've become fantastic ambassadors for our city and they were queuing up every time that we have events. So I'd just like to place on record Mayor Anderson's and my thanks uh, for everybody who takes part, but particularly those volunteers who give so much and actually sell our city so well um, in delivering such an amazing summer of events and beyond. Yeah, I completely agree. I think since being Lord Mayor, I've been, um, I've, I've done quite a lot of weekends and meeting people and people from all over the country and sometimes from other countries who come along here and are just amazed at the events that we put on. And uh, I do, just a quick mention for the selfie challenge last uh, Saturday. It was absolutely brilliant. And the fact that uh, a very councillor Hinnigan was just, and her team. <laughs> We're just absolutely amazing. Congratulations, she, she won the gold. So. Yeah. It, it was an incredibly well-organised event and I hope it takes place next year because I'm going to have a next year. So, just thought to mention it. Have we got any other speakers on this motion? Okay, Kev? You? Ward um, event in Stanley Park with Councillor Rachel Byrne in the summer 
um, and, and, and the Deputy Mayor Anna Bain attended as well and it was a fantastic event to see people from two different wards coming together and I was speaking to, I didn't speak to a lot of people because I left a little bit earlier but we, uh, the people I was speaking to was, well, we didn't even know that, that this was going on today, they just walked past by chance and I know that a lot of promotion has been done on social media but it was just great to see people in, in the park who weren't going to come into the park and did for that day and um, for the children as well, because the events were all free, um, the children who were able to come into the park just got like a little treat that day. And it was fantastic in the middle of summer when parents are finding it so difficult um, with money and costs in, a, in, in, a war, in the ward, which are so highly populated with, with people who are living in deprivation. It was a great, great event, and I know one of the boys were the catcher in Sunny Park, and um, absolutely fantastic. Loved it. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just want to add a little spot on uh, when we've made events and the staff. Uh, I, I just want people to, well, we, we didn't read it out, was, we probably try to go for the record and then at the end to cancel tonight. But uh, read what was presented, what was put on this year by this council. Read it. It is absolutely phenomenal. And I can promise you it will get better next year and in 18 years as well. So just rejoice at that, but also celebrate the fact that we've got a culture team, an events team, a team at the ACC that is second to none and delivering over and beyond the call of duty with loads of resources. That's what we're doing and there's more to come. But this is nothing new to us here in this city. 
Six years ago, the Mayor set up the Fairness Commission, and since then, one of the things has ensured we've been putting serious money into our system support scheme, our BMS team, our discretionary housing payment scheme, along with continuing to shelter those in the lowest income providing council tax support. But let's celebrate today the incredible efforts of our fabulous play partnership, coordinated by LCDS and MPAC, who through Liverpool's voluntary community and faith sector, and with funding from our community's budget, the Mayor's Hope Fund, businesses, the CCG, public health, and our own council's neighbourhood funds have ensured that over 70 play schemes provided 54,000 meals to our children during the summer holidays last year and this year will be even greater numbers. But this has been happening during the last four summer holidays and during every single school holidays over the last two years which has seen as our play schemes delivering on this play healthy element, ensuring the children and sometimes whole families prepare and cook healthy food together, and no one is left out or stigmatised. Our children in Liverpool go to our play schemes, go home at the end of each day with a smile on their face and food in their bellies. So we are already working hard to deliver those first two UN Sustainable Development Goals without being told to or signing pieces of paper, because that's what Liverpool's about. And I learned that very quickly when I first came to this great city back in 1974, as a school kid to help out on the summer play scheme at St Peter's and the Shoes Youth Club, which, thinking about it, Councillor Ross Gross and Mother Joey was running that year. She told me and put me in my place, I can tell you. But we are also working hard right upstream to stop being, people being pushed into the river in the first place. And like Desmond Tutu always asking, who and what is upstream that's causing this to happen? So working upstream, that's where our Fair City framework comes in, where we are ensuring and promoting the real living wage, no inappropriate use of zero hours contracts, fair terms and additions, training and apprenticeships opportunities and local spend. And that's why we're working and using the principles of driven, purpose-driven responsible business with the blueprint for better business charity down in London. So lastly, how will Theresa May respond to this motion? Will she ignore it and look the other way? Or finally, take some responsibility for her government's shameful policies that are causing so much damage to our citizens and change course and take action based on social justice and fairness? Well, let's watch this space. Thank you, Councillor Corbett. Um, Councillor Hart, you're second in this. Do you want to speak now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. I know it's hard to believe, but I've been in the city longer than 30 years that Jane Corbett has been in the city. Um, but like Councillor Corbett, I welcome the ECHO campaign on food poverty. Uh, but, and uh, I have to say, there's always a but when we refer to the ECHO, isn't there? Long before the ECHO discovered food insecurity, this Labour group, this Labour council, was working with community and voluntary groups <coughs> in the city to coordinate activity to tackle the problem. As Councillor Corbett said, we set up the Fairness Commission five years ago to scope the way poverty and exclusion impacts on our most vulnerable citizens, to, to suggest an alternative approach to scope out the problem. Long before any media campaign, the Mayor appointed a Cabinet Member for Fairness and Social Inclusion, a role that Councillor Corbett tackles with energy and compassion. And long before local commentators had acknowledged food insecurity, Councillor Corbett had set up a city-wide task group, which she co-chairs with Bishop Paul Bays. Now that task group brings together faith groups, community activists, our partners in the education field and the health fields to coordinate a robust response to food poverty in the city. There's lots of things going on on food poverty in the city, on top of it. And there's been at least two letters to be echoed from councillors in this chamber today. Councillor Mitchell, Councillor Jared, Jared put something in about the great work that's going on in his own ward. So all of us engaged with that activity recognise, recognise the good work that food banks do. Food banks are not the only solution. Uh, in, in effect, some of us have said many times that food banks represent a failure by our society, a failure to support the most disadvantaged. Uh, and we have a government that now punishes people for being poor, for being in food policy. But what I always say when we talk about the food banks is 
that we must recognise the hard work and the compassion shown by the volunteers and the groups in the food banks who work day in, day out and give so willingly of their time to help fellow citizens. Jane spoke about the Play Healthy programme, which provides play, food, and in addition to playing food, which is so important to those kids and their families, it provides support, advice to families about what the benefits, about appeals, about the whole sanction system. So that's, that Play Healthy programme is there, it's providing support for our citizens during every school holiday. Not just the summer holidays, throughout all school holidays. And I believe it's worth saying that it's a great example of the coordination of activity already in place in the city, where we work with voluntary and community organisations, we work with the clinical commissioning group, with the education sector, all our partners to provide additional support every day during the school holidays to those kids who are at risk and their families. And I, you know, I would urge every council, anyone who hasn't been along to those days, to see what goes on, to see the joy on the kids' faces, to see the families welcoming the support they're receiving. Grandmothers, grandfathers there with the grandkids, eating together, working together, coming together. There's no silver bullet to solve food insecurity. There's no one answer. There's no campaign that will resolve it. But as a council, I believe we will continue our work and change work with the faith groups, with the community groups, with the food banks, to solve the problems, and we'll do it by acting together as we always do in this council. Support the motion. Thank you, Jane. Now I've got three speakers at the moment. I've got Councillor Beaumont, Councillor Sharon Sullivan, and Jim Noakes. Have we got any other speakers? Oh, right. Oh, sorry, yes. Right. Um, yes, sorry. No, not just you, though. No, not. Jerry and Pete Fisher, yeah? So, uh, Tim Burnham. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor Council. This motion provides a great opportunity to pay tribute to the many organisations in our world of Picton that have done so much to serve our communities struggling with uh, food insecurity. Uh, we, over the years, have supported the food share scheme where supermarket surfaces. Tim, just hang on two seconds while I really vacate the. Yeah. Just go quickly. Go. Yeah. Market surplus food is used to provide meals uh, for families during the summer. We've already discussed the uh, summer place schemes, um, but I, think I really want to highlight what happens in the many events we've put picked in Shaw Start Centre, whose staff have been tirelessly serving the community for almost a decade now. Over the last 12 months alone, 157 people have attended the recipe of the week uh, scheme, where families pay a pound, they get a, a bag of food ingredients and a recipe, and that feeds, a family, uh, that feeds four people. 166 have attended a free community lunch, 61 have attended a baby food session provided uh, by Cash for Kids. And all this only in the last 12 months. There are many other things that have been taking place over that period of time. But the um, Shoreside Centre has also given out 77 food bank vouchers. The Central Liverpool Food Bank is one of the busiest in the city. It recently launched a new food hub service where residents can pay a £2.50 subscription into a food club rather than just having a voucher scheme. Now, I wholeheartedly pay tribute to these efforts, but I deplore the circumstances that have made this the new normal. Food insecurity means that millions of people across this country now struggle to address one of the most basic human rights, and that of being able to feed yourself. And in that struggle, people are more likely to resort to cheap, high calorie, low nutrition food, high in fat, sugar, and salt. The food crisis and our health crisis go hand in hand. And the government's recent woeful response to this possible, to this public health problem, deplored by professionals and celebrities alike, will only sort of store up problems for our health service in the future. But that inadequate response is in keeping with our government, that appears to have no interest in making sure the working people of Britain are healthy and have enough to eat. This situation was created by the Commission, the government's decision to pay off the deficit by taking money away from working age people. Six years on, the deficit is still there, but people are poorer, people are having problems with food, and there's no sign of this diminishing. Council, what is going on in the UK regarding welfare and social justice is profoundly wrong. My comment is probably best summarised by the words of the Old Testament prophet 
Isaiah, who said, Woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees, who deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of our people, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless.
my father's butcher, tells you where I lie. Um, uh, in all, on that basis, um, the city of Liverpool, given the size of the city, uh, if we were to knock down literally everything that you see and give it over to supporting um, to supporting people on that 0.7 hectares per person, we have 475, 180,000 people living here. We could support just under 16,000 people. That demonstrates just how vulnerable we are as a city, and it's the same for most urban environments. So when we talk about food insecurity, and I'm glad that councillors Hans and Corbett have brought forward the issue right at the sharp end, we should all realise that food insecurity is something that we all face up to. Um, I'm glad that Councillor Corbett has also agreed that myself and Councillor Beaumont and others, including the Liverpool Food Network, will look at that wider issue um, of food security and how we feed the city. And when I speak to other cities around the world, they recognise just that issue as well. Um, this administration is passionate, passionate about addressing the problems that we see at the sharp end, but we're also passionate about addressing those more systematic issues as well. So I wanted to add that context to the discussion that we have here uh, this evening. Uh, and I hope that not only will we support the motion in front of us, but we'll join in trying to address those wider challenges as well. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll make this quick. I'll be glad. In the, this is a serious point, in the 60s, I wish I found a Mrs. Sullivan to take me in because we had no food, we had no money, we had hand me down clothes. And when I was 12, I got my first job, my second job, and my third job because I wanted to eat and I wanted to wear a nice jacket and maybe a tie. And that's why I'd wear stuff like this now. But I didn't eat. So I go to see a school when I was Lord Mayor. And the children I hear were once in a failing school a year before. And thanks to the great leadership of the City Council and Councillor Corbett, Councillor Small and Councillor Orr, things are changing. And a decision was made at that school that it was a failing school and one of the main strategies was food security. And that teacher, that head teacher, fed every child of over 200 children first thing in the morning because it's the first food they'd had from the previous day at being at school. For whatever reasons, the children weren't being fed at home, but they came in and the teacher fed them. It's now one of the United Kingdom's best schools. They've changed with the absentee rates from 91% attendance levels up to 98%. They win gold awards for literacy and for numeracy, and they do amazing things with the environment and the schools inspired. And I wish I went to that school when I was that age, because that's what security brings you. Brighter kids, happier kids, and a better society, and that's what the city council actually allowed to happen. So well done to the leadership in this council and in our schools, because we need to see more of them. And I would have had to get a job at 12 and cook for my family, but that's what we did. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Mitchell, and then I'm going to wind up this, uh, this debate. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. I'll, I'll declare something of an interest. Uh, I chair the Trust and Trust Food Bank, not a Liverpool one, uh, Nosy Food Bank. It's not on the city boundaries, but we work very closely with the Trust and Trust Food Banks uh, across the city, north, central, and south. And Councillor Hunt is quite right. We've been doing it for five years. Uh, thank you for the echo to actually noticing that people have been hungry for that time. But uh, we should all need to recognise that the only way to bring a solution to this is by working together, by actually bringing the resources that everyone has to the table. But all food banks are, are sticking plastic. We have to deal with the underlying reason why somebody is believing. And so the, the, the Trust and Trust Food Banks uh, give back to work support, they give debt advice support, they work to empower people out of that poverty, which is what we all need to do. And this should not be a contest. I can say 
a share of the cap budget, nosy food bank, our about neighbour, our board has said our aim is to close it down. And let me tell you, the day we close it down, I'll invite each and every one of you to come and raise a glass, because that'll be a great day. That'll be a great day. <laughs> the only way we do it is if we work together to deliver the things, not fight among ourselves, not argue about food poverty snobbery. This is about the basic needs of human beings who live in our city in the fifth richest, richest economy in the world. And I say it every time, it is to our collective shame that we have food banks across our city region that fed last year 60,000 people. Let's all work together to eradicate it and come and join me in the celebration. particularly councillors on the ground who put their neighbourhood funding in and just makes such a difference and also it gives hope to the people who are also doing it alongside of them. So just picking up on what people said about working together, thanks for putting that because uh, that's the way it works and it works superbly. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, I'm going to take the vote now. Those in favour of the motion? You know us. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Now going on to the debate about grammar schools, my Councillor Nick Small, Lana or John Prince and Alice Bennett. Um, can you invite Councillor Small to move motion standing in the same room? Uh, thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. There's many issues faced in schools in Liverpool today. There's a crisis in vocational technical education. There's a new funding formula potentially coming in for schools in 2018 that could see Liverpool schools funding cut by up to £20 million a year. And there's the divisive free schools and academies agenda that's trying to set school against school. Grammar schools and selection by ability isn't one of those problems faced in our schools. It doesn't resolve the issues that our schools are facing. And since 2010, Lord Mayor, this administration has built 16 new schools after building schools for the future was scrapped. We've created the Liverpool Learning Partnership to keep the family of schools together. We've created School Improvement Liverpool as a local authority training company. And we've set up Liverpool Challenge to drive up attainment and to identify shared priorities amongst our schools that are right for Liverpool. And we're working to make school admissions fairer with some announcements coming in the next few weeks and months on that. And Lord Mayor, this is why we oppose selection by ability. We reject this Tory plan to lift the ban on grammar schools, to open new grammar schools, and for every grammar school opened, we will see five new secondary modern schools opened. We reject it not just because it's unfair, and it is unfair. There's a tiny number of ch children on free school meals, children qualifying for pupil premium who attend grammar schools across the country and attend a grammar school in this city. But we also oppose it because educationally it's wrong. Selection doesn't work for anybody. It doesn't increase the performance right across the board. It doesn't increase performance for any one group, including the brighter students, including children who are gifted and talented. It doesn't benefit anybody educationally. And I'm really pleased that the NUT um, came along tonight to show their support with this. I'm pleased that the other teaching unions, ATL and ASUWT, have also got behind this. Because what we need to do, Lord Mayor, is to build up a broad-based campaign with all parties supporting it, with parents, with teachers, everybody right across the board supporting this to say we know what works in Liverpool and to say to Theresa May we reject this bankrupt idea, this 1950s idea of grammar schools and selection viability, not in this city. Okay, do you want to speak, Lana, or...? Okay, fine. Um, 
Do you want to speak now, then, since she's second in here? Yeah. Thanks, all, mate. I am pleased to second this motion. I just wanted to say that this morning, I sat and watched um, Justine Greenham give evidence to the Education Select Committee, and, and I've set aside a couple of hours because I was hopeful that there might be some recognition from Greenham that they've got it wrong on grammar schools after they tested the public reaction. And to be honest, in the beginning, there were some glimmers of hope. Greenham was willing to say that she didn't think the proposals brought forward in May about parent governments were helpful, and she was willing to go back and look again. She was willing to genuinely consider um, looking at making PHSC in our schools statutory to ensure our children have a more rounded education. And she was willing to confirm that she's looking forward to bringing in changes to ensure fairness for summer born children sooner rather than later. So I was hopeful. But Lord Mayor, that's where the will has ended. When it came to grammar schools, Greenham was defiant. When she was questioned on the evidence base, do you know what she said? She said, well, sometimes we just have to try things and just see how it goes. Now, I think that as a council, we should put on record how disgraceful we think that is and how uncomfortable it makes us. Yes, we all know that we're about innovation and creativity and change to get the best for our children. But that's not what this is. What we should never do is support a trial and error approach to our children's education. And we should never, ever accept a let's just see what happens approach to raising standards. Their approach doesn't sound very aspirational to me. And we should be telling the Prime Minister that our children deserve more than such a haphazard approach to improving standards. Thanks all men. If I can pick up on the last point, um, let's try and see what happens. Well, actually, we have. As a society, I can remember Shirley Williams, um, as a Labour Minister then, having to roll back grammar schools. And the trial and error was a trial and error there. It was a trial and error that didn't work. Because not only did it disadvantage people who came from families who didn't have a high educational background, and that may advantage those people who tutored their children for the 11 plus exams. That was quite well established. It's there, the fact's there. But it also happened with people who are late developers in life, people who may have failed 11 plus or could have failed 11 plus, could then go on to get university education. And when the Sydney models came in, and I was actually that generation, the literally that year that came in. Large numbers of people who did fail the level class, who were put into low achieving uh, schools, or would have been, then went on to actually go on to get professional examinations and degrees. So when the point is made, I'm thinking of it in a positive way, um, let's try and see what happens. As a society, the United Kingdom has tried and see how it's going. So, not the United Kingdom, Scotland has a far superior educational system. Um, England and Wales have tried grammar school system and has found been found wanting. And it actually creates a system of low achievement, no aspiration, and it also does not something else. And I think that's the one thing that I think we need to discuss. It actually socially segregates people in communities between those who expect to achieve and those who expect not to. And when you start segregating people as 